So, Galen. Oni. I was feeling the sad brain, the depression wave that, like, the coronavirus is infecting people and it's going up into the air and it's creating these, these sad waves of air and it, it makes us all feel it. So have you not been wearing your mask? Of course I have been. Ha have you been like staying good six Nihonjin. feet away? <laughs> have you been standing six feet away from people? Yes, I have been standing a good two meters away from people. Oh. However, I was feeling the sad brain just before this podcast, but luckily I was saved by just... I happened to go on YouTube. I was waiting for you to show up. Happened to go on YouTube and I saw my lord and savior Fran Drescher <laughs> on YouTube talking about several of her looks throughout the years and she's talking about all these dress names that I have no idea about I don't know anything about an anything about a Chanel Valavache Shvakashdi those are the dress names I don't know can you say that again in your best friend dresser voice uh -huh. <laughs> you got it nailed it and so basically I'm just recommending everybody should just listen to Fran Drescher watch the nanny <laughs> Welcome to the to the, the Fran Drescher podcast. The Fran Drescher Everything <laughs> Podcast. Can we replace the opening theme with a theme song from the nanny? Yeah, sure. Yes! Do it! Sure. <laughs> She was working in a bridal shop in Flushing, Queens Till her boyfriend kicked her out in one of those crushing scenes What was she to do? Where was she to go? She was out on her family So over the bridge from Flushing to the Sheffield's door She was there to sell makeup, but the father saw more She had style, she had flair, she was there That's how she became the nanny Hello, my lovely listeners as a service Friends, thank you for joining us today on the Fran Drescher Everything Podcast. <laughs> this is actually the Nintendo Everything Podcast, episode 77, believe it or not. My name is Oni Dino, and with me I have a post-launch update, hmm? who is not light on content. It's Galen. I am 87 gigs of download. <laughs> 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 Ah, <laughs> uh, the stupid laughs are coming early. <laughs> yeah. Everything's stupid. This is video games, everything's stupid. Galen, you've been doing a great job, I want to tell you, on, oh, on you. thinking on your feet lately with the stupid names I give you for introduction. You've been doing a great job. <laughs> well, thank you. You're welcome. I've, I've, uh... Ironically, I can't think of anything to say to that. So. <laughs> What do you expect? Friends, we're going to be talking about so many uh, post-launch updates and uh, that concept in video games, in modern video gaming. We're talking about Animal Crossing updates, uh, Ninjala and their season passes, also the big old Super Mario Maker 2 mm -hmm. uh, launch, up, launch update, whatever I'm trying to say here. Uh, lots of stuff to talk about there. Also, your credit card may have been stolen by anti-Nintendo Goombas. D yes. How do you think they stole them? They have no, like, fingers to type with. Oh, they got big old mouths. <laughs> and I'm just imagining a Goomba, like, tonguing a keyboard, and it's just going downhill fast. You need to watch your words. No. Nope. <laughs> I mean, it's staying in. That's fine. And anyway, we're talking about so much more. Join us. And as you do, as you're listening, perhaps, mm. go on over to that iTunes app and give us an iTunes rating on there. Or go on to your favorite Discord and share this podcast with a friend in need of a podcast indeed. Mm -hmm. We are on all the podcast platforms. We come out weekly, Sundays, yada, yada, yada. Say something funny here. The nanny, ba dum ba dum bum. Mm. <laughs> I got a stuck in my gaderum. 
I've never been good at that. I've never been good at the, uh, what is that, Yiddish talk? Yes, yes. Well, yeah. you have to be raised on Fran Drescher, uh, Bette Midler, or um, Barbara Streisand. I was none of those things. Yeah, yeah. And that's how you didn't catch the gay. <laughs> Speaking of which, you can I come stood... over to my Twitter where you can catch the gay. I stood six feet away from Fran Drescher. Yeah, but her agnoids, you can really feel those vibrations when she talks. And that's why you gotta wear the mask, too. <laughs> my Twitter is at Oni underscore Dino. I've got the coolest people hanging out over there, chatting with me, saying some hilarious stuff. You guys kind of elevate my mood sometimes. So thank you so much for sending your funny tweets my way. Come join that party on my Twitter. Mm -hmm. Also, I do the Instagram. That's Oni underscore underscore Dino. Galen, tell me about your party. Uh, you can come join my party on Twitter. It is at Mobius087. And you can also follow me and my uh, various Animal Crossing adventures on Instagram, which has the handle of true underscore Mobius. But Galen, you have not only been playing Animal Crossing this week, you have also been playing the Super Lucky's Tale demo on the eShop, yes? Yeah, I, uh, I've had my eye on this game for a little while, and just browsing the eShop, saw that the demo was out there, kind of remembered the game existed, and was like, it's not Resident Evil or Animal Crossing. I have something to talk about this week. Hey, hey! Oh, great! Heaven forbid we should talk about Resident Evil. I know, you know, mm. it, I, I just can't talk anymore about a game that did have a legitimate Lin Nintendo release on the GameCube. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me about this, the Lucky lucky Super. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. So Super Lucky's Tale, or specifically New Super Lucky's Tale. Um, this is a game that came out uh, last year for the Switch, uh, developed by a company called Playful Court. Uh, this is originally published by Microsoft Studios, which is what makes it kind of interesting. Mm. Um, I think it's one of the first big Microsoft titles that I can think of that kind of made its way over during the rumors of them talking and mashing and doing stuff. Right, right. This one? Yeah, yeah that's the one. <laughs> so the game is a... 3D platformer, uh, kind of inspired by Mario 64, Banjo-Kazooie, uh, Hat in Time, even though that wasn't necessarily inspired, but it's a good, like, in that genre of 3D platformers. Mm. Uh, story is very straightforward. Uh, you play as Lucky, who is this fox who gets sucked into a magical world with a magical book and pages escape from the magical book, you have to go around and try to collect all the pages, stop the evil, you know, cat wizard in his kitty litter army. That's actually what they're called. Hmm. And yeah, just try to save the day. It's a very childlike, simplistic plot as far as the game is concerned. And that's kind of a lot of the feeling like I got from this game as well. Hmm. So, first thing is just basic mechanics, like how does the game feel? Uh, game feels good. It's very smooth to play. The actions and the movements were very intuitive. Um, I was a little bit taken back by there's no like dedicated run button, which I feel like is something that should always be in a platformer. Oh, really? Yeah, like you know how there's normally like you hold down a button and you just go that little bit faster and it becomes your normal mode of transportation when you're moving through Mario or any of those games. Not in this one. Well, not in like Mario 64. Not in, actually not in any of the 3D Marios that I can think of. Really? Yeah. I could have sworn they had one where you could just move a little bit faster, but you lost a little bit of control. 2D Marios. Hmm, maybe, I mean, sometimes maybe. there were, there were, you know, mechanics that you could do in 3D Marios, but they were specifically for something else and they just happened to make you go faster. Kind of like Link's uh, rolling in the original Ocarina of Time. Mm -hmm. it, it happened to make you go faster. <laughs> or like the same thing with like Banjo and Kazooie, there was the Kazooie run, and yeah. that was a different move. It made you move faster, but it was for something else. Yeah. And to be honest, this was also the demo, so there might be some faster modes of transportation that are in there. 
Um, I did notice there was a little bit of a way to go faster, and uh, your character, Lucky, has a way to dive into the ground and burrow around. Mm. And I don't know if you necessarily go faster, but it definitely feels like you're going faster. And I found myself diving into the ground, kind of swimming around through there, and then jumping up, making an attack on an enemy, and then going straight back in. Like, it, that was very fluid. I was very uh, impressed by how seamless those kind of, like, went around. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it took me a minute or two to kind of, like, understand, like, the rules of the game itself. But once they were down, yeah, everything seemed fine. Yeah, I also played this actually, uh, I think last year, like when the demo properly released. Yeah. And I had a great time with it. I was really surprised at how just like polished and pleasant just the whole experience was, like how it felt, how it looked, everything. Yeah. I was just like, oh, I'm definitely getting this when I see a sale or something like that. Mm -hmm. The game is very colorful. It was very whimsical with a lot of its uh characters and like set dressings in the game mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> my favorite was i came across these owls that were there and they're just these little like you can't interact with them in much of any uh efficient way or effective way but they'll just sit on the ground and then they they'll see you walking around and they have this like little sad face on and then they go up they jump and they start to try to fly but they're like little baby owls so they just kind of flutter in midair and then they fall to the ground <laughs> and it's freaking adorable <laughs> and it's it serves no purpose right it's just it, like an animation not that i found i wouldn't be surprised if in the main game there is some sort of thing of like hey collect all the owls or try to get them to follow you or something but yeah in the demo i didn't find anything like that i love that i love just pure animations for sake of animations it's it mm -hmm. just adds to the charm and my true enjoyment of a video game yeah, th this was a very charming game. Um, again, a little bit more on the kid side, but I'm not going to detract any points from it at all or anything like that. Overall, I was able to control the character pretty well. I did have one or two times where the camera didn't necessarily fight with me, but I couldn't get it into just the right position I wanted to to make like a more advanced jump or that you know a line of collectibles are you know pop up and go straight to the ground and you're supposed to fall and collect every single one as you go down yeah okay maybe that could have been tweaked a little bit better mm -hmm. but sounds you know, like you just need to get good though yeah it's true you know pro lucky tail speedrunner right here <laughs> mm -hmm. super pro lucky over there is what you you know that's your handle on, on i have mind, a new so. twitter handle <laughs> You can cut that part out. No, I'm leaving <laughs> that in. And you can unfollow him there. Exactly. What a, One other thing I did want to make mention of was also the odd choices for the voice acting. Oh? Yeah, Um. I actually was kind of getting into it when it did its opening narration. Because the narration is done by the main character's sister. I, I think her name was Lyra. And... As she was explaining the setting and the story leading up to it, and her and a bunch of, uh, like, commando fighters were, you know, thrown into a dimensional rift while fighting the big bad of the game. It, she sets it up in a way where I didn't really care about the specifics too much, but I could tell that she was doing a good job conveying the in emotions that that character was feeling. <laughs> The emotions and motivation of Lucky's <laughs> sister. Yes. Uh -huh. um, and I can see how that would be really captivating for like a younger audience. Like it, it felt like yeah, yeah, somebody in a Disney movie explaining something. Mm -hmm. Like it had that level of quality from what I understood from it. But as soon as you got into the game, the first person that you talk to is this little mechanical golem. And he just automatically goes to Banjo-Kazooie just gibberish speak oh i i love that I, i'm so surprised that there was like such a backlash to that when like ukulele came out mm -hmm. and i'm fine with it like yes. i th i think that is a great way to convey uh speech in your game you don't have to have the actual words the emotion of the <laughs> yes like <laughs> i was waiting for you to do it <laughs> i was saving it um 
the way that an actor can convey those emotions can really kind of get the personality of a character across without actually verbalizing the dialogue. But it was very strange to me that you would set yourself up with spoken words and then immediately jump ship on that and go to another format. Like, I don't know if they speak anywhere else in the game, but it just felt like a very strange disconnect that I noted when I played it. Mm, that, that just kind of reminds me of, like, games from, you know, another generation uh, where an opening or, like, a really important scene will be voiced, but then everything else from there isn't really voiced, you know? Well, just the be. really important things. Yeah. So you had a good time with the demo, though? Yeah, I had fun. Um, I think I will personally pass on it for now. I might pick it up if it does happen to go on sale a little bit later. I found the platforming a little bit easy. Mm-hmm. And that could also be because I've played all all the games that these are inspired on. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's that, you know, building up of experience of, okay, if you play a 3D platformer, you know what a 3D platformer is going to be like. And you can kind of, like, s start ahead of the curve. It's like if you start to play, I don't know, Call of Duty and jump over to Battlefield, you can take those... FPS skills that you did from one game to another and they kind of build up on each other. Mm -hmm. But I can definitely see recommending this to somebody who does have either younger siblings or young kids who just want to have a good solid first platformer. Mm -hmm. I think also it's good for people who just kind of want to chill relaxing experience too because there's probably you know some difficult missions in there later that are probably more optional and that kind of thing like you know that's pretty standard game design right now yeah. but like for me when i play that demo like of course none of it was like hard but i was like oh this is just really enjoyable just relaxing exactly. and enjoyable so i'm definitely going to get it at some point yeah yeah and like i said if it goes on sale i'll definitely pick it up because i enjoyed my time that i had with it but yeah. i would you know i would put it a step below uh, Mario Odyssey in terms of how complicated the game can be and how much of a uh, initial skill set you have to put into it. <laughs> so that's Super Lucky's Tale. A total dumpster fire, according to Galen. Yeah, yeah. Burn all the furries. <laughs> hate speech. Is it though? I don't know. I've been watching my wife play way too much Animal Crossing. I That line is blurred for me. Oh, and so now you're developing a hatred for animals? Expand on that. Uh, listen, when my wife puts up a, fi a fish drying rack in front that is full of baby octopuses being smoked outside of her island resident who is also an octopus and asks, is this a hate crime? Lines become blurred. So you and your wife are meant for each other, you're saying? I guess so. <laughs> so you know what I'm not meant for? What's that, Sony Dino? Oh, yeah, it's Sony Dino time. <laughs> the most controversial topic of all, Sony Dino. That's true. I liked the uh, the little touch you put on the last episode. What did I do? You did the PlayStation startup logo. Oh, for... yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I like that. That, that was nice. Uh, I'll do it again. Maybe I did it already. <laughs> I'm amazing. So I beat Final Fantasy VII Remake. Congrats. Yeah. Thanks. You, you've, you've put in the required 30 hours. Yeah. So I don't want to talk about it too much just because I'm still kind of processing how I feel about it. And I, I just don't know if I care, which is the other thing. But uh, I will say right now, like, I'm not going to say spoilers just yet. But right now I'm just going to mention a few things about, like, the combat system that I'm still enjoying. Uh, oh, Actually, I really wanted to kick this off with a PSA to anybody playing Final Fantasy VII Remake. In Chapter 16, I believe it is, it might be Chapter 17, somewhere around there, there is a time when you go up into a vent, like a, an air duct kind of thing, and you have to crawl to the end to get to another area. Along the way, you can look down and view little scenes highly recommend before you go in that vent and they talk about it so you'll know it's coming up you save because lots of people including myself have experienced a game breaking bug 
where you go and you look at those scenes and then you can't back out of the scene at all. Oh. And the game oh. is still just running. And I looked okay. it up online. Lots of people are experiencing it. So just hmm. save before you go in the vent just to be sure. Otherwise, you're going to lose, you know, however much progress. Weird. Okay. Good PSA. I'm amazing. <laughs> Another PSA you should find that you shared on your Twitter is what you discovered about the camera system. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. That's what I'm going to... Actually, this is my first topic that I want to talk about. No. Oh. So, yeah, on my Twitter, you guys should come hang out on my Twitter because I was thinking about... And I'm, I'm thinking I'm still going to do this. I'm going to start, like, a tweet thread noting my differences between the Japanese and English dialogue mm -hmm. and different feel that different characters have uh, different dialogue so for example I've kind of noticed that though very prevalent in the Japanese in the English version Jesse's horniness was uh, played up a little bit more okay uh, already really annoying for me in in the first place so it's not like it like the English version ruined her or something like that but yeah, just little little notice notices, mm, observations <laughs> like that, and the differences Wait. between like character or voice actors and stuff like that, giving off a different personality. I really like Tifa's Japanese voice actress. It makes her movements make so much more sense. Remember last week, I was like, mm -hmm. Tifa's doing all these dumb anime poses. I bet that her Japanese voice actress will, her her Japanese voice will make more sense with these stupid actions. I liked her English voice too, though. But it, I think did, I like the Japanese one more. Did you play the game twice? No, no, no. I just went back to like a chapter because there's a chapter select thing after you. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. So I went back to a chapter and I was like, all right, I'm going to switch over the voice and just kind of get a feel for this. So I might go back and do a few more things with it in a different voice. So that way I can get more impressions. And let's just like chat about this game because I, I have a lot of thoughts and I really want to hear lots of other people's thoughts too um, even th even opinions that I don't agree with I'm always super excited to hear opinions I don't agree with so yeah. come hang out on my twitter at oni underscore dino and we'll talk about Final Fantasy Remake differences Yeah. now I do have to ask um, you mentioned that there was a chapter select I'm assuming this is something like in, either near the end of the game or at the end of the game you get that ability yeah after you beat it yeah. Is it weird to use that? Like, how does chapter select work in an RPG? Does it carry over your stats and everything? Or is it like a new game plus kind of thing? It's like a new game plus. It carries okay. over your materia, your levels, everything. Wow. Okay, and you're actually incentivized to do it because your level cap is higher than you typically will meet in your first playthrough. And then there's more things to unlock as well. So, yeah, there's that. Okay interesting so going back to the combat one of my lovely twitter buddies my translator buddies he commented on one of my posts on twitter about the camera system being really annoying for me last week i said that you can't control the camera when you're locked on to an enemy and you can't with certain settings with a certain selection of like this change and that change and this change and that change, you can lock on to enemies and control the camera free moving with the right stick. It still is an imperfect system, however it does fix my biggest gripe with the game. So if you're also having trouble with Final Fantasy, I posted a picture of what my settings are so that way you can be like, oh okay, I can control everything. Uh, I can't cycle through enemies anymore while I'm in the like pause mode, like the command mode. You could do that before, but not with the current settings. You have to use the left and right directional path. It's not interesting. Anyway, moving on. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I'm, I'm saying that it replaced a big problem with a small problem. So still have gripes with the battle system in certain areas, but really liking it in other ways. Yeah. Another thought that I had about the battle system is I wish you could give your partners some like general orders, like a Tales of game, where you could mm -hmm. be like, okay, be more aggressive or use an item if your HP gets this low and that kind of thing. I wish there would be like some, just some general things, because I know you're supposed to, you know, control everybody and you're supposed to, you know, switch back and forth and do this and that, but just a little bit of something would help because your party members aren't super helpful. They're all right, but they could be better with just a little bit of, a little bit of direction. Yeah. By the way, I found out the uh, the person who made that comment on your Twitter. Oh, please say it. 
Ryoga Satomi. Oh, thank you. Yes, I knew it was Ryoga something. So, shout outs to that dude. Yeah. Also, with the battle system, I I'm really loving all of the boss battles. I think I don't think that there was one boss battle that I didn't like. At least, at least I didn't like it so much that it's sticking out. You know, the boss battles are all probably my favorite because they involve. A lot of complex fighting, and that's when the battle system shines. When you have to plan out, you know, your setup for each character and your loadout with materia, because changing your materia changes what your characters are doing and their stats. It's so important. So it feels like you're really coming at things in a way more tactical sense, and you're building up those、uh, stagger meters with enemies, and you're trying to exploit their weaknesses to build up their stagger meters, and it's great. And I have a really good time with that. However, I do have a problem, and this is where I think like the creators don't understand what they've created, kind of thing. <laughs> When you have a battle with way too many enemies in an area that's not super big, and there were some battles later on in the game, like chapter 15 or something like that, where there was just a lot of enemies, and it was like I can't do any of my strategies. Because、um, mm. you're just getting hit a lot, which stuns you from doing certain things, and there's a build up to your magic attacks, or, or like not a build up, but like a, a countdown or a charge up or whatever. So, and if you get hit and interrupted during doing a magic attack, you'll lose your charge, and you lose your MP, and you lose your ATB, which is your your meter to use anything. So it just you're better off just like using physical attacks and like guarding and everything like that. But I don't know, it, it just like. Too many enemies actually doesn't work with that battle system very well. It just feels unsatisfying. Even when I won, like I never died during it. It's just it all felt like a big mess. It felt like people throwing punches in the dark, and then at the end of it, like they were all knocked out, and I was still standing. I was like, "What?、Well, none of that felt good." Even <laughs> even though I won, there's one like mini boss battle with something. I think it was called a brain pod. That in particular was the goofiest bullshit I've ever done in. A fighting or in a game with a fighting system that was just so dumb. I don't know. People who've played that will understand. <laughs> If you were there in the dark with me, you will understand. <laughs> Not the first time I've had to say that sentiment. <laughs> also, the Rufus boss battle was super awesome. That was a lot of fun, and I love how campy. I, you know, what I want is I want this game to stop being so self-serious because that's actually where my problems come in with the game. I want it to definitely be more fun and goofy and wacky. That's the stuff that, looking back on my experience with the game, I enjoyed the most. Like Roche, the guy that kick flips his motorcycle and stuff. Like, yeah, yeah, do it. Motorcycle、sure. foo. Yeah, that guy is so ridiculous. Um. The Rufus battle was a little bit like that, just a little bit, because he he uses a shotgun and he's using that thing to propel himself around the arena that you're fighting him in, <laughs> and it, his moves are so crazy stupid. His attack、uh, has given me speed. Y- yeah, and he does all these like stupid things.、Uh, it's a great boss battle, and I hope everybody gets to it. <laughs> his redesign sucks though. Like that is some Nomura ass shit. There are belt buckles <laughs> everywhere. He basically looks like an inversed Lulu. You know Lulu from Final Fantasy X, right? Yeah. Weird. So wait, he has belt buckles on the inside. <laughs> he yeah. He basically looks like he's wearing a dress, and it's all in white, and he's a guy, and he's got belt buckles. So it's basically the inverse of Lulu. You know. <laughs> Anyways, his redesign、okay. looks like shit. His hair is nice. His face is nice, but God, damn it, I hate. No more as ridiculous character design like that. What what is his obsession with ball buckles? <laughs> I don't know. Him and Tommy Vaso, what's going on there? Oh hi Cloud, how is your sex life?、Mm-hmm. <laughs> so how is your soldier life? So all right, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the story right now. Not a whole lot, just because Galen doesn't know anything about the original or the remake in terms of story, so it's gonna be a one-sided conversation. So it's just. It's not worth it to go into it too much, but isn't that most of our conversations? <laughs> Stop talking. Me talking right now. So come over on my Twitter if you guys want to have a conversation about it. For right now, spoilers on Final Fantasy VII Remake. I'll probably put in a little future Oni Dino thing right now and tell you when to do the message from the future. Oni Dino. Hi all, future Oni Dino here. If you want to skip the 
story spoilers, we don't go into it too deep, but still. If you want to skip that, go to about 44 minutes in to the episode, basically right where the news starts. Okay, so I heard little rumblings as I was in like chapter 14 or 15 that the ending was very divisive and I was like, oh, cool, because I figure if it's divisive, I will probably like it because I I didn't need this remake. I like the original a lot and that mm-hmm. game is still really fun to me. I like that battle system. I like everything. I like the visuals. Don't need it to be remade. So... If they were going to remake this, then, you know, fine, I'm on board. I like those characters. I like that story enough, the world. I want to see different things being done. So I was excited for them to do different things. So I figure if the game is divisive at the end, probably because they did some different stuff, and that that means that I probably am going to like it. I was half right. They did some different stuff, and I didn't like it. (laughs) So the thing I want to say here is the combination of Nomura, Kitase, and Toriyama together are basically the J.J. Abrams of video games. So... Sephiroth just use a lens flare attack? No, no, no. Galen, what does that mean to you when I say this? I'll let you know, but I just want to hear you guess Exactly correctly. that. That sounds like Sephiroth used a lens flare attack. No, and, no, no. It all, like, sparkled around his Bishojo eyes, and then it went down to the four belts that were added to his character, and there were the same Bishojo like, sparkles around it. There were nine. Nine belts. Oh, okay, so I, w- I was close. Okay, back to the one-sided conversation. Let the adults talk here. Yes, let the adult. <laughs> I'm a big boy. <laughs> uh, so what that means is that it's all cool visuals and mm-hmm. cryptic and emotional. Everything is cool looking and emotional feeling and sweeping and grand. So Matrix 2. With no regard for cohesive storytelling. So Matrix 2. It's Kingdom Hearts as hell. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. Kingdom Hearts is a sad story for me because I liked those games so much. But over time, I realized how badly I was getting burned and how much Mm. I didn't care because I knew that they did not have a means to an end with their story. And I, I mean, I haven't played 15 yet. I've heard lots of criticisms about that game. And so I was worried and my worries basically came true with this ending that they they're just writing crazy stuff because it looks cool or it feels emotional and destiny and you know my the true path and all of that bullshit you know what i mean like yeah it's kingdom hearts 15 is all over the place yeah it's and that's exactly what they've done here there was some stuff going on in the story and i was like oh that's kingdom hearts that's kingdom hearts shit and then it got really terrible at the end really they're basically doing alternate timelines future timelines mixtures together and i'm like ugh like i'm not wholly against those concepts at all but Ah, you have to be able to write the shit out of that you have to write that in a very satisfying way and i don't think that these guys are capable of any of that uh, because of their most recent past work so i have no faith in what they're gonna write i'm glad that they're gonna do stuff differently because that's the implication with the ending is that things are going to be very different moving forward. It's not going to be a remake of, of the original game. And that's good. But what they set up, I guess, is not great. It's just Kingdom Hearts bullshit. And I'm just like, I can't be on a listless voyage anymore. I'm too old for this, guys. I've seen enough. To be fair, you're going to have a good five to seven years for them to figure it out. So. And I hope I die before then. <laughs> hey. You might. (laughs) (laughs) But you know what? Choose your words carefully. (laughs) As they lower me into the casket, they're going to be like, you know, passerby is going to be like, coronavirus claims another victim. And then my soul will creep or croak and be like, no, it was no Mora (laughs) from beyond the pale. There's just one too many belts. My, my coffin will be covered in belts. 
I'm gonna talk to your husband. We'll make that a thing. <laughs> oh, he's going down with me. And if you were near me, I'd make you go down with me too. You couldn't drag me down. <laughs> We had an argument about this before. I know we did because I was about to say the same thing. I will bite you until you die. <laughs> Speaking of biting until you die, that's how I felt with the ending with this game. So basically, there's like these plot guiding ghosts and it's like some sort of meta narrative and I'm just like eye roll over all of that. Mm. And they... They were not in the original at all. They just, like, added this stuff in there. And I was like, oh, this is Kingdom Hearts. Knock it off. Knock it off, I'm guys. I'm assuming they're the leftovers from Final Fantasy Spirit Within. Boy, they feel like it. They feel It feels <laughs> like Spirits Within mixed with Advent Children. And then at the end, you fight more of these wraiths. And this is all totally different from the other game. And then you fight what is probably a future version of Sephiroth, not actual Sephiroth. And then you fight... Probably the three guys from Advent Children, but they're in Kingdom Hearts, like, heartless forms. You know how you fight a big, gigantic heartless in the very beginning opening of Kingdom Hearts 1? Yes. You fight that kind of thing at the end of this game. This was not in the original at all. And that's fine. It can it can be different from the original. But if you're just going to make it Kingdom Hearts, I'm f***ing out. It's not <laughs> for me, fam. Like, I, I'm too old. Yeah, I, I, I don't said have time for this. I said this on Twitter. Um, I want to see what materia can slot into a keyblade, and I think we're getting closer to that uh, that realization. Basically, yeah. Also, please, speaking of which, slot that materia into my walker. Has anyone seen my walker? Because I'm old. Tex I'm old. Texas and I'm being Ranger. Out of touch. No, this is this is me joking on myself. I'm clowning on myself for being out of touch and like, oh, the old person doesn't like the new game. Blah blah blah. I do have to say that I like some of the changes that they did with the game. I, I was encouraging change and hoping for change, but I just, I, I wanted some structure. And with those three guys at the helm, structure ain't happening. So personal question, I have never played Final Fantasy VII. Would you recommend me this game? Absolutely not. Absolutely yeah. not. As Especially as I went through it, this is not a game for people who haven't played Seven. And, like, granted, lots of people have played 7. It's been re-released throughout the years. There's a, mm -hmm. there's an updated port on PC, PS4, Switch, and Xbox right now, so you can play the original. Um, play that before you play this, because... And here's the other thing, is the storytelling in this game isn't great. Like, they don't set up character motivations for Cloud or Sephiroth, and you're just like... Why is Cloud doing what... Like, I had to constantly... Because remember I mentioned this last week. I really wanted to hear what your response would, to this game would be as somebody who's unfamiliar with the original. So I had to constantly put myself in the in the place of an, a person who hasn't played the original as I was playing Remake and be like, is there context right now? Or are they just assuming that you have played Seven and you know who Sephiroth is and you know what's coming later and you know these flashes of the future visions and that kind of stuff? And... I don't know. I just I just don't like it, and that's a shame. Well, I'll tell you what, in three months when it goes on sale for like 30 bucks or less, I'll pick it up, I'll give it a try, and I'll let you know what I think. Honestly, I don't think I'm gonna care. So don't <laughs> I mean if there if the world weren't an embarrassing nightmare right now of coronavirus, I'd be like, like let's hang out for a long weekend and I'll give you the game. You still need to play Resident Evil 3. <laughs> I know. I'm just, I'm either so busy or I'm either so emotionally exhausted that I am burying my head into a pillow. Yeah. I beat that game, by the way. And? It, it's fine. <laughs> cool. <laughs> yeah. Video games. They're fine. 2020. Yeah. Turns out I saved right before the final boss. So. Oh. Yeah. So, uh, trust me, the ending did not sway my opinion of the game in any way whatsoever. <laughs> Except, goddamn those dodge rolls. That's all I'm gonna say. So, anyway, just, there's a lot of talk of people being like, it's a meta narrative, and they're addressing the fans and stuff. And I am not one of those people that's, that thinks that, like, the writer's intention is the only interpretation of, of the work. Hmm. Um, I think whatever your interpretation of the work is, is valid. 
Um, I don't think that that's really their intention with it. I don't know. It's just a feeling I have. Regardless, my point is that that doesn't matter. I yeah. don't care about this interpretation of meta narrative or anything like that. All I care about is like a structured story or that these people are even capable of writing a means to an end instead of just being like this emotional cool stuff and like visually awesome and just J.J. Abrams shit. Yeah. Well, and to be completely honest, if this was a love letter or a meta love letter to the fans, they would have given the fans the full game. Like we were well, here's, perfectly here's fine. the thing though. Here's the yeah. thing. And I'm going to interrupt you on that is because this ending basically is telling you as the player that moving forward, it's going to be a totally different game. We're, we're redoing Final Fantasy VII. This is like a Final Fantasy VII redo 1.5 and sequel. So I understand why they didn't do the full game because they're setting it up like this. But I mean, theoretically, they're setting it up like this. I'd be surprised if they haven't even storyboarded the whole thing to the end. Well, at least we know they're going to do a Final Fantasy VII 2 and a Final Fantasy VII 3 Clouds Return. And I'm... Probably not. I, I know you made a joke there. I, I don't care. I'm sorry. I don't care. <laughs> don't. <laughs> My thing is that I don't care about this story. There's a lot of theorizing that's happening, and a lot of people like doing that. I don't because it's you talk yourself into a circle, and this is not interesting enough to theorize, especially when I'm like, you guys don't know what you're doing. So here's my question for you. What? Take <laughs> Sorry, well, okay. it's just anger at Final Fantasy VII Remake. I, I know, I know, I know. Take Final Fantasy VII out of the equation. If this was a standalone game and you were playing it for the first time, you did not have all those expectations and all of that uh, legacy. Take all of that out, look at the game as it is and how it's made. Do you think that you would have a different opinion? Or... A similar opinion, but with less hatred because it's not related to all of those dropped expectations. No, because here's the thing is I didn't go into this with very many expectations. I really didn't because I am one of those people that's like a, a remake of something doesn't ruin the original by any means. The original still exists, that kind of thing. So yeah. I didn't care. I wasn't like, oh, I can't wait for this or that or whatever the, the hell. If you take out the equation of original Final Fantasy VII and you have this game, you have this game that's expecting you to have played a game that doesn't exist. You know what I mean? Like, it's just kind of like with Final Fantasy XV where parts of the major story were outside of the game and they were asking you to watch a movie or watch an anime prequel or something like that. There's all of this stuff that they don't explain in the game because they assume that you already have the knowledge going into the game. They have structured that story like that, and that's bad. And that's why I'm like, you know, if this were a true remake of, of the original, they and they were wanting to, you know, expand out the Midgar section, they would have to completely rewrite where characters establish their motivation, where certain things that, es that even establish their motivation happen in the storyline, because... The Midgar section was the opening of the game, and then you get into the game, and then more things unfold. And it was paced out that way. You would have to move certain things later in the game to earlier in the game, but then they would have to make sense in the time. You know what I mean? Like, it just needs to be completely redone if they want to stretch out the, the Midgar section. And that's why they haven't established, like, who even is Sephiroth? Who even is Cloud? And, I mean, all you really know about in this game is that, like, Shinra Bad Company... Um, because they're sucking out the life planet or the lifeblood of the planet and that's it and you, you spend 30 to 40 hours taking down a bad company and that's it and you don't even take down the company <laughs> <laughs> you tones and I mean I don't bomp, know bomp. <laughs> anyway I, I have lots more to say about that but just <sighs> it just it's done I'm done with it <laughs> It is not worth your time on the Fran Drescher Everything Podcast. Oi. <laughs> <laughs> so the news, what's happened in the Vietnamna? We have news. Galen, tell me about this Animal Crossing update. Yeah, so we got a little bit of a uh, update coming around for us Animal Crossing people. 
Uh, basically, they are talking all about Earth Day, which is coming up. Um, there is a new Animal Crossing villager named Leaf, which my wife was particularly happy to see again. Uh, he's coming around and selling different plants that are exclusive, shrubberies, things like that. Just ways to decorate your island. Um, they give you some more incentive to kind of take part and to plant these things as well. They give you more rewards that are a little bit better than what they did with Bunny Day. So happy about that. Cool. Uh, one of the big things for me is that they are also expanding on the museum. So beforehand... Any bugs or fish that you collect, you can donate to the museum and they kind of have a little aquarium or zoo, whatever you want to consider it. There's also a place where you can donate fossils and it's like, you know, the head of a T-Rex, the body of a T-Rex and so on and so forth. Mm. They are expanding on this museum idea with art and... Uh, this is not new to the Animal Crossing series, but I, it's new to me because I've never played Animal Crossing before. Mm. You get your artwork through a new, uh, person who comes to the island on a sketchy steamboat named Red. He is a little fox and he will sell artwork to you. Sometimes it's not always real artwork. He sells forgeries, which you can tell because there's like, he'll sell you a copy of the Mona Lisa, but the eyebrows are super bushy. Or there's one where it's like a bunch of French officers in colonial times, which is an actual like artistic piece that you can go and you can see. But they're holding baguettes? Uh, well, this particular one, he was missing his hat, but oh. yeah, basically. <laughs> I really was hoping they were going to hold baguettes. No, it's it, it's fun because uh, you never know what exactly you're going to be getting, and you really have to kind of like know your art history, or at least have the That's foreknowledge cool. to look it up on Google to see if you can spot the differences between the two, because you can examine it before you actually buy it. Huh. And it just really kind of strengthens this idea that yeah this guy is sketch as hell and i absolutely love that <laughs> yeah make that money red mm -hmm. um i have not seen this in the game but they have also alluded to weddings that you can do in the game oh. i don't know if this is between your villagers or if that's something that you can participate or you can marry people from other games or whatnot that, that'll be very interesting to see when they really kind of bring that element forward but uh, in the update trailer that they put out there, you can check it out on YouTube. Um, yeah, they didn't really go into much detail other than saying, hey, this is a thing. So <laughs> that I think will be worth noting to see where their boundaries lie on what they consider as marriage. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> mm -hmm. We'll be talking about that. Yeah. I mean, this crazy world, you know, if you can't marry your dog villager, who can you marry? It's Animal Crossing. The lines are blurry. <laughs> Moving forward. <laughs> With Ninjala. Oh, yeah. Forgot about this game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is the sort of Splatoon-esque vibe game it from Gung Ho be. Online Entertainment. Yeah. So it's like a... It's 4v4 or Battle Royale with eight players. Ninja game so you're playing as ninjas with like batons instead of like katana and you're hitting each other with with that and you got special moves and a whole bunch of stuff so the devs of ninjala have been doing a dev diary i think like once a week or something like that they're up mm -hmm. to their third one and on their third one this week they rolled out information on a season pass seasonal updates and how seasons are going to last eight to ten weeks they also showed off a little bit more of the gameplay and the game flow of like what you do in the game and how you fight. And they also promoted their upcoming free open beta on April 28th and 29th. Uh, the list is on our website of the exact times when the beta is open. So do check out nintendoeverything.com. Mm -hmm. But this is also a, a free to play game with microtransactions in it. Yeah. So it's free to try it out <laughs> <laughs> it, it's it's taking it's taking that kind of seasonal approach that you're seeing with newer 
free to play games are where it's free to play you can make progress and it's a slow burn but you can still get full experience without having to delve too much into loot boxes or anything like that but what the game really wants you to do is to buy into every single season and right. that's where you get uh the all of the extra perks you get even get even more bang for your buck for the time that you spend into it um fortnite does the same exact you know right pay structure with their game that's who really popularized it yeah um the the magic the gathering game that i play online also has a very similar thing where yeah you can do your daily things and get coins and experience but really when a new set comes out you want to buy into that particular season because you're going to get even more packs and stuff for your for your game yeah yeah like for me i mean i was i was neutral to optimistic about this game when i saw it initially i think last year is when it first came out and then it was silent for a while then we heard it resurge and then they said it was you know free to play and stuff and that kind of like soured me on it a little bit just because i know same here and, and i know it and the reason for that is because I know what the gameplay loop is going to be like. And yeah. I just kind of, I don't know, I kind of don't feel too uh, invested in something like that, especially if it's an online game, which, yeah. you know, this is the kind of structure that that pay structure has is an online game. I just don't play a whole lot of online games competitively. Yeah, I'm. I'm kind of right there with you. Like when I heard it was, fr I hadn't heard of this game before. When I saw it, it was like, oh, this looks kind of neat. Heard it was free to play, and I was like, eh, okay, maybe I'll try it. As soon as I heard that they had the seasonal format to it, though, I mean, I really lost interest just yeah, altogether. Yeah. And I don't want to be fully down on it. I mean, there's an upcoming beta happening. I'll probably give that a try, and I encourage everybody else who's you know vaguely interested in it to give it a try because why not? Yeah, I mean, I won't judge it until it comes out, but it's got a lot of things going for it in my eyes, personally, mm. so. You mean going against it? Yes. You said going for it. Oh, yeah. What you said? And then, continuing with the trend of rolling out updates, we're talking about Super Mario Maker 2 with their big old 3.0 update, the last major update, they call it. Yeah. I, I was kind of sad to hear that this was the last one that they're planning on doing, but... I'm happy with what they came out. Yeah, so some highlights for me. I mean, there was a whole bunch of stuff on there. We have a great chart on our website, nintendoeverything.com, where they list like all the different features and powers that are coming to it and which modes they're available to be used in. Mm -hmm. um, for me, the highlights are, of course, Super Mario Bros. 2 Mushroom. Yeah. And the Cursed Key. I, I can uh, I can see a lot of fun levels being made with that. And like being able to ride your bullet bills uh, really kind of change it. My favorite thing about this game is watching people play the Kaizo levels. And this changes a lot of what you can do in that kind of like an environment. Yeah, yeah. When they introduce things that change the mechanics of how you move and interact and can uh, achieve a level or even build a level to be achieved... Yeah. You know, that's so exciting. That's why I was so excited with the uh, Zelda update that they did, you know, last mm -hmm. year. Exactly. Uh, another thing that they added on to here were the Koopa Kids. Yeah. What do you think about that? Oh, I love them. I love those guys. <laughs> I would like to see new villains and new stuff happening, but I love those guys. Yeah. So, I mean, Super Mario's... Mario Maker has always been a love letter to the franchise, so I would not expect to see a lot of, like, new type of enemies or anything like that coming into it. Do we ever get, uh, uh, Toadette? Or Super Toadette? Or whatever the not Bowsette version is. <laughs> oh, yeah, we, we got her. I can't remember right? if we did. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> uh, whatever. Did we get Mario Et? Neither of us own this game. <laughs> but you know what? One of the big things that I think everybody was asking for, and this was bigger than any sort of power-up that they added to the game, was the ability to make your own worlds. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was a big thing. There. Yeah. No. No, that is that is intense. And that is something I think when you and I were just spitballing like ideas on how to improve the game, that mm -hmm. was one of the ideas that we came up with. Yeah, I think I think you're right. Because I remember like 
feeling like this should have been added before. And you can customize where everything is laid out. So it's not just mm-hmm. like, here's your template, and then you put in your, your levels. Like, I would have been um, not okay fine with, with that. Well, <laughs> not fine with that, but I would have been, like, expecting that. But this one is, like, a genuine, like, a map editor. It's, like, the yeah. same It's the same size uh, map. You can't change the map size. But you can change the aesthetic. You can change where things are located, what it looks like. And it's great. That's fun. Yeah, and you can even make, like, an entire world. Like, you can literally make your own game. Um, I think I remember reading that you can get up to eight different worlds with a... I think it's about 40 courses or mm. so overall. I I don't think, though, that you can share this online. Mm, I can't remember either. I, w- I would not be surprised if this was something that was limited to just being able to like show it to your friends or something like that yeah yeah which is a bummer though like yeah it would be so much nicer even if it was just like you have to send them a code directly and you can't like look it up online or something like even something like that because i understand them being ugh, i don't know whatever yeah uh, nintendo's always been really weird about link or sharing online different ways to make custom content like yeah look at that animal crossing and how convoluted everything is with the dodo codes versus you know inviting your friends and yeah everything yeah like that so yeah and this is not the first time that they've done some weird online shenanigans too now if we didn't have a talking point already locked and loaded this would be <laughs> a perfect segment into our next news topic but galen tell me about the talking point that you wanted to bring up considering these games with all of these games they've really kind of like reminded me so much that there is a new genre of games that we are seeing out in the wild nowadays and that is what i'm dubbing this idea of an evolving game or an evolving game series and it's we, we don't just get a game anymore and that's what you get. And we've seen that previously with like DLCs that have come out and so on and so forth. But even in their, like these free to play games and games like Mario Maker, like you don't need to buy any DLC or anything for Mario Maker, but the game that you play today is vastly different compared to the game when it first came out. Right. And it just, it's fascinating to me because it generates this, this new idea that getting the game when it first comes out and being part of that hype isn't necessarily the only way to go anymore. Because sometimes you want to wait for a little while and see what the game ultimately becomes. And then in that, we also see a lot of, like, the whole seasonal uh, approach to games as well. I mean, yeah. Njala is doing this, of course, but we see this in games like yeah, Fortnite and Destiny mm-hmm. as well, where the, you start with the game, everybody has that experience, the game that you play later down the line, of course, it's not the same because they've done all the updates, they've done all the revisions, they've added new content, mm-hmm. but there's also this element of if you get in when the game is early in development, you can be there as part of this evolving process. You know, in Fortnite, being able to say, hey, I was there when the when the world went into a black hole. Oh, yeah, right. And there's this, like, weird <clears throat> legacy aspect, and it just it invites this whole sense of community that I haven't remember seeing in other games before, except for maybe a few select MMOs. Um, rather than invites a sense of com- a sense of community, I would like and elitism. To, I would <laughs> like to rather say that it exploits the FOMO that people have nowadays. Uh, yeah. FOMO is getting worse and worse with like just like online interactions. I mean, people our age and older can remember when the internet didn't exist or when the inter- not that it didn't exist. It's uh when it was not. Uh, household use and we didn't have social media that we constantly connected through now that we have that it's you know changing our society in in incredibly fast ways and people are growing up being accustomed to and even us we're accustomed to just because we've been living with it for so long constant connection constantly hearing and seeing so many different things i think that the seasonal stuff and some of this post-content stuff 
is a way to make people feel like you don't want to miss out on this, so you better yeah. buy it. And then the other thing is that, like, it is a battlefield in terms of marketing and in terms of keeping your product relevant. And that keeping your product relevant is something that consumers have wanted and marketers have been trying to push so that way their stuff doesn't just come out and then immediately get drowned. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, a perfect analogy for this is, is the eShop or even the PlayStation Store. But the eShop because that's the one I visit regularly. Yeah. Launch day for a game on the, the new releases thing. It comes out, so does a bunch of other things. By next week, it's off the page. It's buried now. And that's mm -hmm. exactly what happens with games in marketing and in the public eye. So doing post-launch updates is a good way to, you know, keep your game going, so to speak. Yeah. And it it's not it's not to say that that doesn't work either because I mean look at the fact that we're talking about Super Mario Maker 2 a year after it just came out with a level of excitement of look at all these new things that you haven't been able to do before exactly and I didn't want to buy that game until the link thing came out and I was like oh cool I want to get that game I'll probably pick it up when it's on sale yeah so so yeah I mean it works I'm not definitely not arguing that I actually like for me I like post content updates um, mm -hmm. I think that it takes a good developer and publisher though. And I think Nintendo is, I, mean, I think all of them are hit or miss, but I think oh, Nintendo absolutely. has a, has a better track record than a lot of others. And I would say that they are very good at releasing a game that is a complete game or feels a very satisfying game and then yeah. adds other stuff onto it. Uh, th this is very, uh, uncharted territory. I've seen people who have absolutely loved this kind of format. You know, you said it yourself. You know, you like the post-launch updates that come out. Mm -hmm. I am understanding more and more on, like, why Animal Crossing is doing things the way it is. And because time travel in the game has been a huge problem. I've known people who have are currently on their year 2052... And they've done that to go and get all of their millions of bells through interest and basically skipped having to wait through all of it. And they want their content right now. Mm. But see, the whole wanting everything right now, too, that is so like the current modern society and the mindset of everything is I need everything right now and I want everything right now. And like if you gave everything to everybody right now, right away, if, if that were even possible, you know, mm. then the people would consume it real quick and then throw it away. Because exactly. that's just how things are happening in modern society. And it's it's funny that you say that because one of the big complaints that I also hear on the other side of this uh, argument is, you know, the, the old farts like us who go ahead and say, I remember back when you would spend $50 on a game and you would get the entire game unlocked all I don't right say then that. and there. I don't, I hate that sentiment so much. <laughs> And I hate okay. that romanticizing of the past, like, well, well, I remember before. Well, that is true. Because then all you're just going to be is you're just going to be a boomer in the future saying that exact same thing. You know what I mean? Like, you're just going to have the same freaking problems where you're just Weren't like, you oh. were just well, playing Breath of Fire 2 the other day? <laughs> I was. Suck it. That game's great. I'm not playing it because a uh, modern games <laughs> suck or something like that, and because yeah. it was better in my day, just because I'm that's what I'm used to. Nah, I I, I get what you're saying on that. I and yes, there there is a, a problem. <laughs> there is a problem with romanticizing that sort of an idea, but they do have an argument that you know it, on some you're... games, like it, plus here's a lot the of AAA thing. games. Well, yeah, hold on though. So here's the thing: is that like it's not like Here's this game and they're taking parts out and then they're giving it to you. I mean, I don't know. I guess yes, you can't you can't confirm that it that. Sometimes happening. Well, it dep <laughs> it depends on what game. So like here yeah. for example, Mario Maker, let's talk about that. This the game uh itself has had these updates come out over the course of that game's been out for over a year now, right? Like that was mm -hmm. 2019 that that came out, right? In June or maybe July. I want to say so, yeah. No, June sounds about right cuz it came out right like right before E3. So here's the thing is just like with DLC that you pay for, that is made on a separate budget and sometimes by a separate team. Sometimes yeah. alongside each other, sometimes not alongside each other. For example, with the Pokémon DLC that we saw, 
that there's a different director directing that than the base games because it's a different team, a different budget, a different schedule. The other people move on to different things. It's it's all about scheduling and like the people that were working on the base game are working on something else or they're taking their break uh, in between projects and then moving on, like, you know, which is a healthy True. thing to do. That stuff is how we end up getting more productivity in the long run. And people Correct. are looking at it so very short sighted and they're like why don't we get the full game right now and blah 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 it's like because if we were getting all of that right then and there we'd be getting the game released probably later and few games overall because of the way that scheduling works like it it's so hard to explain this because i barely understand it myself but you have to be aware of this kind of concept and being aware of that requires you to have worked in you know corporations i think for many different years and see how so many different departments operate with each other whether it's in tandem or whether it's you know un unlinked on one single project yeah well and it's interesting to me that you actually bring up the uh the latest pokemon game because i feel like that is a very interesting example of an evolving game more than anything else yeah and that is also a good example of a game that feels like something was just taken out of it you know what i mean mm -hmm. with yeah. with the the lack of being able to bring in Pokemon that are not in the national decks. Exactly. No, I, as I said before, I think this is a very kind of uncharted territory and something that we're going to have to deal with as far as like finding settled ground sooner rather than later, because we as the consumers are basically saying, hey, this is what we approve of. This is what we don't approve of. Like, I love that what they're doing with Mario. I love what they're doing with Animal Crossing, and I'm perfectly willing to spread out my time in the game if it means I can enjoy the game a little bit longer. Yeah, and I mean, like, your your experience is there. It's not like you got half the game and then you get it later. You know, it. some people will argue that, but it's like you don't... And, and on the other side of the coin, there's no, there's no hardcore evidence that that game is not complete because what is complete is... A, oh, God, what's the word? Um... Why did I just forget the word? <laughs> uh, what are you trying to say? Like, it, it's not concrete. It's It's got... Uh, it's up to got one's it. interpretation. Uh, opinion? <laughs> no, no. Sub I'm, it's an it's adjective. Subjective? Subjective. Thank you, Jesus. There you go. I'll leave all that in. <laughs> Find it. Thank you, Jesus. But it's, it's subjective, like what is complete, what isn't complete, and that kind of thing. You know what I mean? No, absolutely. There's very few things that are really concrete, and I don't know. I just, I'm so tired of, of that kind of an argument. You see that argument in comment sections and yeah. in forums all the time. I'm not bothered by it, and I'm only going to buy things that I want to buy and things that feel like a complete experience to me. Everybody should be doing that, but I'm not going to have a big old freaking conniption about it to keep with the well, Yiddish. Let's let's take the opposite side of this, you know, the spectrum here as opposed to the free updates. Let's look at a product that is made to be an evolving series. Um, Ninjala, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, I know I use the Fortnite and the Destiny as an example, but those games kind of fall into this category too. Um, you know, it, is this something that you see being a, a substantial, self-sustaining game model uh like it do do you think we're gonna get seasonal games five ten i would say 15 years ago but we'll probably all be dead by then years down the road i it's gonna evolve from here it's gonna be different and yeah i don't know it's hard to say because it's it's gonna be weird with how hardware goes uh i mm -hmm. I can foresee our near future, not this coming console generation, but maybe the next one, being very heavily reliant on streaming. Um, that's going to depend on infrastructure and hardware, though. It, you know, so it's just going to be weird. And if it's all streaming, just like, you know, I mean, look at our our way that we consume TV and, and movies. Many people, I dare say the majority of people, are fine with streaming everything and not owning physical media anymore eventually that's going to happen with video games too maybe not like people like our age there's i mean i don't know it's it's an age thing but i mean like people that grow up being accustomed to streaming video games or streaming movies or something like that are gonna be like that's fine because that's what i've always done 
You know what I mean? It's going to eventually change over 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Well, on that note, like, you know, you mentioned the whole, you know, the S word of streaming games. Uh, that also kind of leans into the idea of subscription to games themselves. Like, you know, one could consider what Ninjala is doing right here is you are subscribing into the game itself in order to get that experience that you're getting yeah, out of it. Yeah. If you want to do that paid one. Do you think that is something that will be um, a stable model going forward? Or do you think this is just more of a trend and people are going to realize, hey, I already have Netflix, Hulu, Disney Plus, right, uh, right. you know, Apple TV, um, Pornhub, uh, just all these different subscription services. Right. So. That's what you have, right? <laughs> yeah, I, it's so hard to say because the whole thing with like these season pass things is that they're trying to demand your time. They're trying to, you know, oh God, what's that word? I'm sorry, my, just my brain. Uh, they're, they're trying to consume your time and yeah. you only have so much of it. So it's going to get overpopulated just because I think a lot of these are online competitive games as well. So like, for example, look at hero shooters. Remember hero shooters were really big and like with Overwatch and stuff like that. And uh, oh, yeah, 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 all yeah, of yeah. those games that came out that died, like Battleborn. Well, and Overwatch also really kind of blew up with the whole microtransaction aspect of that. Yeah, yeah, that loot boxes and stuff. I remember... Part of what... Oh, go ahead. Yeah, that became part of what made that game self-sustaining. Yeah. So... Um, I remember when Overwatch first came out, because I was interested in it. Um, mm -hmm. My friend had bought it, and I happened to be visiting him in Atlanta, and they were playing it, and they got a loot box or something. I remember saying, what's a loot box? <laughs> because... I, I mean oh naive little Sony Dino <laughs> well that was also because at that time it, it wasn't, wasn't prevalent it wasn't you know all right roasting everywhere yeah yeah so it, and I just didn't play games that would have contained them and then now it's everybody knows what a loot box is right and yeah. it's crazy to think that that was just not that long legal ago legal courts in Denmark know what a loot box is <laughs> they sure as shit do <laughs> what up my people in Denmark exactly I mean, at this point, I think we're just more speculating on the state of things. So yeah, yeah. We, we can talk in circles around this one. Um, I'm going to throw this out to the listeners, though. I'd love to hear your guys' opinions on evolving games Yeah. more than anything. Like, is this something that you want to see more of? Is it something that you couldn't care less? Do you have a particular model that you would like to go for? Would you rather see paid dlc versus free updates versus uh, god forbid loot boxes <laughs> yeah yeah so and super shout out to our listeners uh we have like just the coolest people who write into us and interact with us on twitter and stuff like that you guys are all super cool and i just couldn't be happier with like this little community of people from all over the world that we've amassed that hang out w with us on this podcast you guys are great yeah. You guys are awesome. <laughs> and also in the news this week, we heard that Nintendo Network IDs were used to access about 160,000 Nintendo accounts illegally. Now, what this is, because this is confusing because this is Nintendo's infrastructure. It was all people who tried to download Cooking Mama. <laughs> <laughs> See? Crypto mining is real. Exactly. That does on mama. <laughs> All right. So here's what it is. Nintendo network IDs. That's what were exploited. Nintendo network IDs are from the Wii U and I think 3DS days. That's what Nintendo used for their online stuff. Yes. They have since dropped that and they are now talking about, or not talking about, but they're going with nintendo accounts that's what you created with your switch okay so this is specifically for things that are for older generation of consoles however nintendo network ids could have been linked to your nintendo account when you set it up you you had to set it up that way so like yes. i did with mine just because it was like faster to set it up or something like that when i first got my switch i don't remember so your Nintendo Network ID could be linked to your Nintendo account, but it's not something that you're like creating these days, the Nintendo Network ID. Yes. 
So it's confusing, but I hope that that helps explain. Correct. Nintendo has, in response to this, they've reset passwords for all Nintendo Network IDs and the affected Nintendo accounts, and you can no longer use your Nintendo Network ID to log into your Nintendo account. That, that honestly means nothing. You don't need your Nintendo Network ID anymore. It's an old obsolete thing now from how I understand it. So don't exactly. worry about that at all. It, it's not like everybody's Switch passwords just got, swi got switched over. Correct, so. correct. The, your Nint Nintendo accounts weren't compromised. The IDs were. Some accounts were uh, compromised through those IDs. So anyway, what you need to do is do a two-step verification on your Nintendo account. So mm -hmm. go to your My Nintendo website or whatever, go to the options or whatever, and then there's a thing that says do two-step verification. It's very easy to find. I found it immediately. Yes, and from what I understand, uh, they sent emails out to all of the email accounts linked to the network IDs that were possibly uh, affected by this. That's correct. I f I think that they're in the process of doing that. I don't know if yes. they've finished that or not. But yes, they, they are going to uh, contact or they already have contacted those affected. But anyway, in general, you should have two-step verification on. Go do that for sure, just to protect yourself. Also, if you're concerned, like, you know, was my account logged into or not, you can also check your login history on your Nintendo account to make sure you weren't affected. Um, that's in the options menu somewhere. So go check that out to, you know, make sure you're safe. But also Nintendo did say that there was no breach of servers, databases, or services. So this isn't, this isn't like a big old crazy thing like with Sony. Remember Sony? They didn't uh, encrypt passwords. Yeah. This was back before the PS4. Uh, they didn't encrypt passwords. People hacked into their accounts and stole everyone's password. Basically, it was it was a huge yeah, breach. It... <laughs> yeah, that was. Uh... Hey, I got some free games out of it. I remember that. <laughs> yeah, that was when I was playing video games so little that I barely knew about it, and then I missed hey, out on my on my opportunity to get some free games. <laughs> That was that was depression Oni Dino. Remnants of he still lives. I am he. You are <laughs> the walrus. <laughs> oh god. And lastly, another embarrassing announcement. It's not embarrassing, it's depressing. There's a a new thing happening to possibly replace E3. It's called Future Games Show. Yeah. Presented they're... from Games Radar. This was an inevitability, and I'm surprised we haven't seen things about this sooner. Well, here's the thing, though, is that this is Games Radar doing their own thing. IGN is also doing their own thing. Yeah, separate from IGN. <laughs> yeah, we're going to see, like, competition on this right now, which is kind of weird. Uh, so anyway, Games Radar says that this future games show is going to be, quote, a digital showcase of the most exciting games of 2020 and beyond, end quote. It is an hour-long broadcast that will include, quote, trailers, announcements, and deep dives on existing AAA and indie games, end quote. End quote. <laughs> so it's going to be news, previews, interviews, all that stuff, and it's running exactly when E3 was supposed to be running, June 9th yeah. to 11th. So it's going to be weird because they didn't announce who's involved in it or anything like that, but we'll see. I don't think they could have. I don't think that they've gotten that all locked down. It's, it's one of those build it and they will come kind of situations where they're going to be like, Hey, we're talking about all the game stuff. And then be like, Oh, I have a game thing. I want to talk to that. Yeah. I, I mean, you would hope so, but if there's competition happening, I don't know. This is a weird thing that we haven't seen before, at least yeah. that I can think of. I mean, trade shows don't really compete with each other when they are happening at different times, but everybody is trying to, like, capitalize on the E3 absence this year. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to be part of that capitalization. So no, I'm proposing right now no, I hate it. that we do we the don't Nintendo do it. Everything Podcast Game Show for E3. We are going to stream live from June 9th at 6 a.m. to 7 p.m., I will tell you what time zone, and we will tell you about six of the most mediocre games of 2020. This is the worst thing I've ever heard. <laughs> People are just going to tune in. They're going to be like, who are these two desperate weirdos? 
It's the internet. Everybody says that. <laughs> so, anyway, I guess, like, things like this, Future Game Show, is good for the small guys, but, I mean, are the big people like Sony and Nintendo even gonna bother with this? Um, they, they already have, like, a means to do their own thing. But, yeah. at the same time, by not participating in something like this, that means that they don't get to market to a potential audience of people that maybe aren't tuning in to them directly. Well, and I mean, it's interesting because... No pun Sony intended. Has... <laughs> Sony has already stated even before all this, you know craziness started to happen that they were going to be dropping out of e3 this year yeah i think that's because they had beef with the esa though like i yeah, i said this last year when sony didn't appear but i think that some old white guys got real angry at each other in a boardroom meeting and then uh, sony was like we're not doing it anymore i i know that nintendo's gonna be doing its own thing i know microsoft is probably gonna be doing its own thing because it'd be crazy not to right um, they'll probably the do big... it at the microsoft theater that's right there at the... yeah probably <laughs> even though there's um the roni <laughs> uh, all the all the big companies you know ea ubisoft bethesda you know anybody who can pay enough people to get a second rate live band to play you know unrelated music hey pull my devil trigger Uh, they're going to be having their own shows, like, regardless of whatever happens here. Well, we so, did hear that some of those people that you mentioned, I don't remember who, just because, like, whatever, uh, they're going to be involved in the IGN show that they're going to do. Oh, and they'll probably be involved in both. They'll probably have representatives going to both stations talking about the same game. Uh, oh, just you think there's going to be the a same... huge overlap? Oh, absolutely. I mean, oh. would you miss out on this opportunity? You have two competing factions of who's got the latest news. What's the restriction to say that you can't be on both? But here's the thing is that they have to like that, you know, it's an expense for them to do this, you know, whether they're paying to do it or whether they have to set up different things. And especially when it's just two things happening like the same week and it's the same exact audience it's the same exact everything. It's purely redundant. So I think one's going to survive, one's yeah, going to die. Yeah, it's absolutely redundant, but it it comes out of the same like marketing budget for them. It's more exposure during one of the I'm going to hottest looked over weekends. Please hear my air quotes over the internet. What did you say? Hottest uh, news weeks on gaming on the internet. Hear my air quotes over the internet. It's <laughs> a terrible sentence. I know it was. Everything you've just said, just put it back in your mouth. Regardless, I'm positive we're going to be seeing, you know, the same big games brought to, you know, both of these. You know, maybe somebody will have an exclusive, the other person will have another exclusive, but there's definitely going to be overlap on some places. Uh, so, And it sounds like they want to aim, you know, they want to aim real high. They want to aim for all those AAA games. And typically I don't play AAA games just because they don't interest yeah. me. So I know. Eh. I guess we'll be covering it here on the Nintendo Everything Podcast. Game show. <laughs> Desperate Weirdos. That's what yep. I should name this podcast. Desperate Weirdos? Desperate yeah. Weirdos. I could approve of that. Actually, that's a pretty good name. <laughs> Actually, that's a really good name. I love the people who like tune in and this is like their first episode and they just see the title of Desperate Weirdos and then have the theme song of the nanny play. Like they're gonna be so confused. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome first time listeners. Welcome to my nightmare. Yeah, this is about it. The nightmare never ends. <laughs> so here on the Nanny Everything Podcast, we also do additional DLC. And we recommend you, you some some stuff that we saw on the internet. Some crap. What'd you see? What's your crap? <laughs> uh, my not crap is actually a movie that I watched over this uh, past week called Hunt for the Wilder People. Mm. Uh, it is a New Zealand indie film. Came out in 2016. Uh, directed by... I'm going to butcher this name and I apologize in advance. I'll correct you. Don't worry. Uh, Taika uh, Watiti. Ah, yeah. Pretty good. Oh, nice. Yeah. Now, this is the guy who directed... I'll get you uh, for Thor something later. Don't worry. Uh, I'm going to give you plenty of opportunities, too. <laughs> you don't even need to try. Uh, this is the guy who directed movies like Thor Ragnarok and uh, Jojo Rabbit. Mm -hmm. Also a great movie. 
what, one of my personal favorites, What We Do in the Shadows. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, fantastic movie. I happened to catch it on Hulu. So if you have that, give it a watch. Uh, it's all about this kid who's been th thrown in and out of the juvenile... Uh, oh, God, what's the word that I'm thinking of? Not juvenile. Detention? Uh, detention system. No, it was a... Um, Foster care. Thank you, sweetheart. <laughs> <laughs> if that picked up on the mic, I'm keeping it in. I really hope it did. <laughs> uh, he's been in and out of the foster care system and finally settles down with this one family. Um, due to events that happen, he ends up running away into the New Zealand bush or wilderness. And he is accompanied by this grumpy old man who happens to be... You know, making sure he doesn't get himself killed. Mm. And there are hijinks aplenty as there is a manhunt that starts to happen for these two individuals who are in the woods. And it, I was pleasantly entertained through the entire movie. The humor is spot on. Mm. I love this kind of wit that they have going on with everything. Um, there were legit parts that gave me the adult feels in like just say feelings complex. the word exists <laughs> these are complex emo complex emotions that i can relate to um <laughs> so yeah highly recommend this movie it was really good and very much a surprise because i went in completely blind mm. so that is a great recommendation i also have a great recommendation this week we, we, we got strong additional dlc <laughs> Sony, do you know what is your recommendation? No, no, I'm back it's to Oni Dino. Actually, Sony. Okay. There's a new song by my favorite band ever. This is a band that disbanded quite a while ago, like maybe five years ago, six years ago, and they're they just got back together. Boys to Men. NSYNC. <laughs> the guys who did the theme song for the nanny. It's a female voice. I know, that's what makes it impressive. You're a fake everything. <laughs> People can have range, I'm just saying. My favorite band that Galen is ruining this moment is Tokyo Jihen. And they have a new song out called Eien no Fuzai Shoume, which means kind of like eternal alibi. Sure they do. <laughs> they are excellent, excellent rock band with elements of funk, pop and they do so many other genres too they they soul blues they just transcend genres and th it's just like true music genius that is coming out of japan that you typically don't hear you know this isn't some akb 48 nonsense mm, mm. don't get me wrong I, I don't judge people for all that stuff but i'm just saying that like japan's got good music too and here is some of them actually the lead singer of this band her name is Sheena Ringo and she is doing some of the music for the Tokyo 2021 Olympics <laughs> so you know clearly held in high regard uh, if you want to kind of get a feel for some of my music taste check it out this is it fun fact she also has a co-starring role in Resident Evil 2 remake oh yeah she's basically Ada Wong <laughs> basically Ada Wong in remake 2 <laughs> so good. Hey, stop bringing up the Resident Evil on this podcast, Galen. Mm. I don't know. That is another game that got a GameCube remake. <laughs> <laughs> Some might say the original remake. The original remake? Oh, what a terrible word. Yeah, well, what a terrible world. <laughs> <laughs> terrible world. <laughs> Did it sound normal? I tried to make it sound normal. Hey, you're good. You're good. You're okay, good. Okay. Okay. <laughs> now on to our most ninjastic, not a word. Keep trying. <laughs> now on to our most basic segment of the podcast. Are, nope. are you calling our listeners basic? Galen, throw out an adjective for f sake. <laughs> Now to our most lucrative segment of the podcast. Sure. This is going to be the listener mail. And if you have pennies for thoughts, 
you want to write into our email nintendo everything pod at gmail.com that email one more time is nintendo everything pod at gmail.com and you might sound like this funky motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> i'm tired we've got an email this week from our dear friend micah hey micah how's it going hey micah good to hear from you again Good to hear from you, as always. Micah writes in, Good day, gentlemen. As I hear reviews and impressions of the Final Fantasy VII Remake, I often draw comparisons to the Tri-Ace game, Star Ocean's 4. Star, I feel that Star Ocean! <laughs> you you I feel... come correct when you read Micah's email. <laughs> I feel that Star Ocean 4 was incredible but did not receive as much praise because it doesn't carry the recognition or nostalgia of a Final Fantasy game. Are there any development studios that have made a game or series of games that you personally felt were made very well, or a studio that you would prefer for any other reason? If so, is there an IP that you wish that developer could license for a game? This is an utter daydream situation, so everything is on the table. Love it. Personally, mine would be the developer try a Star Ocean 4 team. Star Ocean. <laughs> but the IP is the Stargate universe, specifically the show, not the entire Stargate fictional universe, which, good call. A lot of potential with that. Um, Definitely. I don't know. I've got mixed feelings on Stargate, but anyway. <clears throat> I hope everything is well for you both. Signed, Micah. Uh, there is a postscript. I will not read the postscript on this time, but I will summarize that it alludes to uh, some of my vernacular that I use as a Midwesterner. Uh, fun fact, I was both born in the Northwest, moved to the Midwest for a little while, and then moved back to the Northwest. So uh, I've actually had several comments that my uh, my wording and my accent is a little bit of both, so. I find it hilarious that, uh, by the way, thank you very much, Micah. Thank you very much, Micah. I find it, <laughs> uh, uh, Micah is a fellow Midwesterner, and I yes, he is. love that he called you out, Galen, for your Midwestern accent, and not me. No, yeah, it was great. What? Oh! Ah! <laughs> 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 well, well, now you have to mention it. Okay, so Micah mentioned specifically Galen when he says, yeah, no, or no, yeah, uh, or oh, no, for sure. Like, that's very much apparently a Midwestern thing. I never really noticed it. Uh, I don't think I really do that too much. I'm actually, like, hypersensitive of my accent, but when I'm, like, arguing with Galen, I slip right back into my normal accents of being kind of Midwestern or kind of Chicagoan, so... I, I thought I sound actually very <laughs> Chicagoan on this podcast, except for th that interview with Joe Zija, I went to my very neutral American accent. Robo Dino. Not Robo Dino. So, wait, get back hold on. To the actual question. No, no, hold on. It's, it's, screw it. We're, we're off the rails. Uh, I just want to <laughs> let everybody know because my husband has a, a really thick Chicagoan accent oh, uh, yeah, compared does. to me. I, I woke up this morning. <laughs> to him on a zoom call like a conference call with his his co-workers and they were supposed to wear something weird uh for today for whatever reason and he was wearing a octopus kigurumi which is you know like a, a, a onesie he's wearing an octopus one so that's what he was wearing i woke up to him in his chicago accent saying i got an octopus suit i got an octopus suit and i was like what is happening what 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 is life? <laughs> but that's a great sentence for a Chicagoan to say. I got an octopus suit. <laughs> but Micah, uh, love that you wrote in about uh, hearing accents. I am super linguistic, crazy person, so I love hearing about all those things. Thank you for your, your insight on that. But that was not your main question. Your main question. Yes. So specifically, this was in relation to development studios making particular IPs of games. Is there anything that you would want to see a particular company helm and go for? 
how about you go and then I will go? The one that really struck out at me the most was probably my favorite developer, level five, taking the reins of the Mega Man Legends franchise. Oh, okay. I, I want to see that happen specifically because I want to see what level five would do with Mega Man's uh, digger weapons. Yeah. I think that could be really fascinating. Yeah, that's a great choice. I think that's a good marriage. So I tried to think, just because Micah went with a TV show and a video game, I tried to think outside of video games, but like my preferred media is definitely video games. But I would love, absolutely love, to see Monolith... This isn't possible at all. Whatever. Monolith Soft make a Breath of Fire grand RPG. <laughs> I think they do awesome at it. Because the interesting timeline and lore of Breath of Fire is partially established, partially completely unestablished. And I think that Monolith Soft do a great job with writing timeline spanning interesting storylines that they get just grand enough, not too grand, not too crazy, and they get a little sci-fi. And even though Breath of Fire isn't sci-fi, they do go um like historical and i think that monolith soft would do a really good job in in writing like a historical and fantastical uh, i can see that story. i can 100 percent see that yeah all right you um, go i've got the most off the wall one and i want to hear your opinions on it i want to see cyber connect and rockstar games collaborate together to make a game based on the Cowboy Bebop IP. Oh. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Why not? Can you see, can you see that? Like... Yeah, the, but the I think it might... I don't know if it would be too fun. What do you mean? <laughs> like, the tone of it. So, CyberConnect is a weird choice, I know, but I really feel like they could... Like, if, if they focused on the uh, the martial arts aspect of Cowboy Bebop, combine that with the, the world building and the personalities of NPC characters and that Rockstar is best known for in their games. Saying NPC character is like saying ATM machine. <laughs> <laughs> See, I told you I'd get you back. Yeah, there See, you did go. you hear the way I said back? Back. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I I could really see those two companies like could just go into town and making something absolutely fantastic. You know, you just made me think of this. What about Grasshopper? Grasshopper Manufacturer, the people that make No More Heroes, doing oh, yeah. an Outlaw Star. I think that that would. <sighs> yes. Yeah. See, that I think they would have the right tone for something like that. Oh, man, and they'd have the whole grappler arm ships. Yes, my enemy, Weeaboo! You're welcome. Ah, thank you. <laughs> I, forgot he, I forgot he existed. <laughs> Bitch. Really, it's just early 90s anime. That's all I really care about. <laughs> hey, keeping with that tone, I would like to see Omega Force, the people that make the Warriors games from Koei Tecmo, make okay. a Sailor Moon action RPG. <laughs> Because those games are all it. about flashy attacks. Sailor Moon, they've got lots of flashy attacks. That's what I would love. I love Moon that. Moon Prism Power, and all of a sudden, 40 enemies just go flying across the screen. Yeah, it doesn't have to be I a Warriors-style game, but it, it should be a flashy game for sure. Let's be honest. It does. It doesn't have to, <laughs> but it probably would be. So another one I got is the Goemon series. Sorry, I'm talking about video games. Okay. Why? The Goemon series. Yeah. The mystical ninja himself. Yes. A 2D one made by Yacht Club. <laughs> I love it. They I would, like this idea. They would totally get it. They would do the humor. They would just nail it. I would I would buy that game. I'm telling you right now, I would buy that. Do you have another or? I, anything else would be off the top of my head, so I'm good on grabbing it up. Well, since you're fresh out of ideas, Galen, how about I keep going? This train don't right. stop. Go ahead. Platinum <laughs> Games, a developer whom I dearly love. I think that they would do 
awesome at making an X-Men action RPG. Huh. Okay. They would need to have some strong writers, though, to write those interpersonal relationships. Hmm. Mm-hmm. On that note, I would also love to see a Rocksteady game come out with a Justice League. Oh, okay. In the vein of their Arkham or Batman Arkham series. In fact, I thought about this. You could actually set this in the same uh, world or the same uh, canonical universe as the Arkham series. Wow, what a I know nerd. that. Well, okay, so I know that <laughs> Arkham Knight was supposed to be like their their end of the series as a, as a whole. Yeah. No, I'm telling you, Arkham Legacy, and it's all about the Bat family. It's who you play as. It's got a system where you can change out between characters. We saw that in previous games. And then each new character you get to play as has a different skill set that unlocks more of the world that's out there. And it's all about trying to find who is impersonating Batman. And you can follow the Battle of the Cal timeline with some own unique twists. It writes itself. And the name is right there. I'm handing it to you. Like a little baby bird that had just fallen out of its nest. Take this. Take care of it. Watch it fly. Oh my god. Galen did the the, the bat thing with his hand let, that Danny DeVito did. <laughs> the bird. Yeah. <laughs> and that Please, 89 Batman can I movie. offer you a Batman in this trying time? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Arkham Legacy. It's such a good game and why have they not used it? <laughs> well, I have nothing to say to that. Thank you. Now, something that is, like, sort of tangentially related to Micah's question, something I thought of was, I'd love to see Yoko Taro write an alien horror game. So we're not talking so much about, like, gameplay or whatever, but I want to see him write something in that universe because he writes really okay. weird stuff, and I think that he could take the, the cosmic horror approach and the sci-fi approach way better than what Ridley Scott was trying to do with it with uh, some of the more recent movies in the Alien franchise. Yeah, yeah. I I see what you're trying to do there, Ridley, but you're a senile old man. You can make a very beautiful looking movie. <laughs> He's into some really weird stuff. <laughs> I, I like some of those themes. I do. None of them were implemented or ex, uh, executed very well. Meeting your creator and them wanting to kill you. Galen's making a face at me. Meeting their cre your creator and they want to kill you. That's a cool concept. <laughs> I was, make, I was making a face of the fact that I was like, yeah, he's into some really weird things. And then you're like, yeah, I can kind of see where he's getting at. Like, I'm talking about like alien. Ser I love the alien series. Come on. I, I know. I know. We went to go see Prometheus together. We did. That was a <laughs> horrific scene. That one scene. There's a lot of horrific about that movie. There was, but there's one that stands above the rest. Yeah. But on that note, though. The inverse of what Micah was asking. I would love to see an alien-style Metroid film. I can totally get into that. Now, it wouldn't be something where, like, you're on a crew and then they get picked off one by one or something like that, but it would be very much a creature feature where you see all of these monsters that Samus usually sees as she's, you know, exploring. And I've mentioned this before, I think, even on the podcast, but I would love to see Charlize Theron play Samus. I think she is excellent for Samus casting in a, in a film. Would it be too meta to have one of the scientists of the uh, researching the Metroid just kind of run out as everything is going to hell and just be like game over man! Game over! It would be stupid. Yes, we're not doing that. <laughs> it's the worst <laughs> thing I've ever heard I'm you say. I'm not a writer. <laughs> <laughs> and also I just want to briefly mention one other IP that I couldn't figure out how to do this. I couldn't figure out how to make a game out of it. But the film that I probably recommended on the podcast sometime last year was Suspiria, specifically the Suspiria remake that was on Amazon. Uh, uh, there is a, a whole trilogy of stories there involving the three mothers. There's Mother Suspiriorum, Mother... Oh, and I don't remember the other ones, their names. But... Somehow that could be made into like a horror video game spanning time time zones, not time zones, uh, time ranges. 
eras, <laughs> spanning eras, and different locations in the world. And I think that that would be a, a very fun, like, thriller, investigative horror movie. Game. 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 <laughs> <laughs> I just thought of another one when you said that. Go ahead. I am going to mispronounce his name because I cannot say this guy's name for the life of me, even though I respect everything he does. Taika Waititi. No, 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 no. Um, Guillermo del Toro. <laughs> <laughs> I said it. I'm terrible at saying his name. But you know who I'm talking about. Guillermo del Toro. Guillermo Yeah. It, the Toro. double L in Spanish is a like a kind of Y sound. I don't speak Spanish. So I know yeah. you don't. That's why we don't communicate. <laughs> no, it's got an octopus suit. No. <laughs> uh, him and Hideo Kojima, because at this point they're like a package deal. I want them to tackle the Fatal Frame series. No. Fatal Frame, Fatal Frame with PT vibes. No, 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 no. No, no because here's the thing: is Kojima doesn't know how to write women, and not that Fatal Frame has like really well written <laughs> women. But like, if we're if we're trying to trade up on this, we don't trade just, down. Hey, all I'm saying is, creepy knows creepy. There's and plenty of creepy. people that know how to design creatures, and people can design creatures. And no, Hideo Kojima Unchained is is Death Stranding. <laughs> it's on the nose themes. All right, then I will retract my director back in your suggestion mouth. of this who would you like to see tackle a fatal frame game uh the the guy who made well no he's probably old and senile now but uh the the time that he made it the guy that made the grudge can't remember his name hold on hold on i'm looking it up takashi shimizu that could be interesting I love Fatal Frame. I also love Micah. Thank you for writing into us. This is Thank a great question. Thank you so much, Micah. Yeah. I absolutely love these games that we could just go ham on it and just like come up with all the weird scenarios. You sound like a boomer by saying go ham. Hey, Micah, tell me about uh, Star Ocean 4. I haven't played that one. I haven't played 4 or 5. I've played the other games in the series, though, and I really love 2 and 3. And Micah... Also, in your postscript to that email, tell us about Ham and your opinions on Ham. People do like the way he says Ham. <laughs> ham! <laughs> so stay tuned to us by checking out NintendoEverything.com with all of the news 24-7. We also got the Twitter, at NinEverything. Also, YouTube.com slash NinEverything for the YouTube, obviously. My embarrassing nightmare is on Twitter, 24-7, at Oni underscore Dino, and my Insta, Oni underscore underscore Dino, Galen. You can catch my living nightmare on Twitter, at Mobius087, and my dreaming nightmare. That's a thing, right? Instagram, it's true underscore Mobius, and it's late. <laughs> How embarrassing. That's the subtitle of this episode. <laughs> <laughs> Desperate Weirdos, colon, how embarrassing. I'm going to put that on my resume. Oh, God. Put that on my business card and my tombstone. <laughs> <laughs> the, the one with the <laughs> casket <laughs> wrapped up in belts. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the one with Nomura taking a steaming dump on my casket as it rolls into the grave. Ah, uh, he's being covered by the darkness. <laughs> so we'll see if we're still alive next week. Until then, for everything Nintendo. Uh, stay tuned to everything Nintendo. <laughs> stay tuned Bye. to Nintendo everything. Bye. I have one line. <laughs>